Hello there, my name is Byron, and in today's fundamentals video, we're going to be covering a very, very wide and broad topic that is how to paint any miniature better and faster. Might sound too good to be true, stick with us. So instead of just giving you a list of paints in this video, which I think a lot of people want to see, and then maybe they follow it and you get frustrated or confused why things don't work out how you're expecting, we're going to give you a method that you can hold to if it's your first time painting a miniature, if it's your hundredth time or a thousandth time painting a miniature, beginner, intermediate or advanced, we're going to give you numbered steps that you can go through or refer to to improve the quality and speed of your miniature painting. So this is a comprehensive video. We've tried to cover absolutely everything that you will need kind of all rolled up into one bundle. So hopefully it is a really, really thorough resource that you can go back and refer to. The reason for providing you with this type of a video is it's the type of video that I would like. And if I sit down and I give someone a painting demo, it's exactly the type of information that I try and give them. I think a lot of the YouTube videos out there, there's nothing wrong with this. They give you um, less method and more recipe. And I think learning the method is absolutely what people need to improve the fastest as miniature painters. It's gonna help you make better decisions. So the aim here is to give you a fishing rod rather than a fish. If you're process based, you can follow the steps. That's absolutely fine. And if you're a bit more creative or arty, then if something does go wrong, you can have a little look at our steps. So you may be, you know, you chose a different base coat than you could have or something like that. You'll be able to pinpoint the exact reason for your frustrations and things not going according to plan. Let's jump in. Okay, so number one, we're not even gonna be putting paint to our model yet. It is about picking the right model and picking a good model is gonna help you to a high quality paint job as fast as possible. So there's two things that I'm looking for primarily here after the just the quality of a model. Do not choose a bad digital sculpt. If you're 3D printing, print it at the highest quality possible. And I'm gonna want the highest quality of textures, just quality, you know, that shows up easily. Ones that wash well, contrast well, dry brush well, airbrush well, there's nice edges, stuff isn't wobbly. It's been sculpted at high quality and they're cool. Cool is very important. And I want the lowest, quantity possible of textures. Highest quality, lowest quantity. What do I mean by that? Let's pop up some examples on screen. Plague Bearer, it is skin, it is horns a little bit, and it is weapon a little bit. It's basically three textures and two of them are tiny. The Necron Lord that I'm painting here, that is just a great big shiny robot, and it's got maybe a weapon that's glowing. That's about it. Two textures at a push, eyes, if you want to add another one. If one of these textures is the vast majority texture, you're gonna be able to use texture-based techniques without any worry about mess whatsoever. For 95% of this model, it's just metal. We can use high quality texture-based techniques to get that done as fast as possible, really nicely, not worrying about mess. And then we can jump and finish off the two little bits that we've got, which is the orb and the scythe. Examples of models that are more hard, ones with filigree, ones with trim, ones that are just completely covered in like grenades, purity seals, you name it, they are festooned in things that need painting in different colors. That is just gonna slow you down. You can still use a texture-based technique to get down, let's say the armor on a space marine, but then you are gonna to have to detail all of those little sections afterwards. It doesn't make it bad, but it is gonna slow things down. Number two, open pose or model access. If your model's got something here that's far enough out that you can see its chest, but you're not gonna be able to reach its chest easily with a brush, it is going to be more difficult to paint. If there's a robe or something swirly, the model that we've chosen has a little bit of this going on. I'm just going to have to choose to leave the inside back of his coat, coat, cloak, Necron coat, dark because I can hide it then. So that's going to be in shadow for us there. That's how we're combating it. But do be aware you're going to need to get at your model in all of its different positions that you would like to paint. So if it's got something next to his chest, you'd like it really close, so you don't have to paint behind or quite far away, or ideally, like a little T. That doesn't mean you want every single model to be stood by this, it makes them look bad, but uh, you want a nice, open, helpful pose, or a compact pose. Number three, and this absolutely trumps all the other rules, you have to like the model. Do not pick a model that you don't like, because you're about to put a load of time into it, however much or however little, you should like the image you're painting, and you should think it's really cool. No one wants to talk about assembly, I will be very quick, or you can skip me. So you need a model that is gonna be easier to assemble, ideally, because then you're gonna to get to the painting faster and you want one that is you know, fairly, fairly helpful in terms of you, the assembler, having a nicer job doing so. So you don't want one that's got a massive amount of pieces unless you're really into assembly. And some models are just better for hiding kind of seal lines, which is the line made where the molds have been pressed together front and back to make it our hidden 
Um, again, if you're 3D printing, print it out at the highest quality possible, and then you'll have the least prep to do. Get rid of all your little bridges, joints, and stuff like that. A couple of quick tips for assembly. Use your clippers with a flat side to the model, and when you're clipping a part off the sprue, this is really important. If you don't want to break anything, clip the most delicate part first, and clip the most chunky part last. Because if you clip a chunky part off first, there is enough force in that to shake the piece, and often that can be enough to snap the most delicate part. So you do it in reverse order, delicate to most chunky. Okay, so we've covered that we want a model with a high quality and a low quantity of textures. We've got our Necron Lord. All of this is generic information. You can apply it to whatever you're painting. Now I'm gonna find a way to paint the majority of my model fast, efficiently, and at a decent quality as fast as possible. So what's that for this model? I'm gonna choose paints that cover well. I'm gonna choose something where the recesses are naturally the right color. And a really important thing is, I'm gonna try and pick a method where I can paint as much of the different types of texture on the model, or different parts of the model, in the same way as possible. So if this was Slap Shop, that's the dry brush all over approach. You can have your gray down and then your white, and you do that all over the model. And then at the very last moment, you just filter it with the contrast, filter it with the contrast, filter it with the contrast, and you've shared like the same first three to four steps or so for every single part of the model. That's not just for Slap Shop, you can apply that with other techniques or methods as well. You probably do it with your base coat, let's say the entire thing's base coated brown. You just base coated everything with the same color. So that's one shared step. We're gonna try and introduce as many shared steps as possible for the largest percentage of the model possible. So here, that's gonna be getting a good quality base coat down and use colors that cover well over my Chaos Black Primer. And then I'm gonna use a metallic dry brush method that covers as much of the model as possible. And we've got a sneaky little filtering method that's gonna allow me to turn some silver bits gold in one step. So I'm painting the majority of the model in the same way, basically. You want a couple of striking aspects to your model. Now, what do I mean by this? So one of them is a model that has eye contact. Big eyes are helpful. They're a lot more helpful than small eyes. I've got a dragon there look, that looks great. He's got the biggest eyes of anything. And I've got a tiny little um, photon dude down there with some like cool but minuscule sunglasses on. One of those was a lot easier to paint than the other. Eye contact is very important. People are gonna focus on a few things on a miniature, as should you. That's gonna be the face, it's gonna be the base, incredibly important, more on that soon, and it's gonna be the weapon. So um, you're gonna look at things that are cool or different or have a different shine or finish to them. So that would be special effects, like things that look like they are glowing, things that look like they're on fire, uh, blood effects, um, anything that is immediately recognizable as from the outside world or nature, like crackle paints on a base or grass tufts, that's a really good way to instantly up the quality of your miniature as well. When you're looking at your model, the base is a huge percentage of what you can see when looking at a model, whether it's the front of the model or the back of the model. When you're looking down at it, which you are normally, you're not looking at the model from on level like a lot of photos are taken, a huge percentage of what you can see is the base. And the bigger the model, the bigger the base. So putting a larger amount of time into the base is definitely a really good idea. One of the things that I use to illustrate this when I'm teaching a class is that you can have a average quality painted army on high quality basing from like three to six feet away, which is how far people are gonna be normally, what you'll see if you're just looking at it at a glance rather than inspecting it and being critical, they're gonna see a high quality army. If you have a high quality painted army or miniature, this doesn't have to be army related, and it's got low quality basing, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a low quality army or miniature. And when you get close, you're still gonna say, that basing's not that great. Always have your basing be on par or greater than the level of your miniature or aim to be. It's a really, really good way to spend less time overall and have an overall brilliant looking model. So we're using dry brushing here. That's a brilliant texture based technique. You could use contrast, you could use airbrushing. Um, I would really encourage you to find a method that you find fun and enjoyable and whack down you know, a high quality job on the largest proportion of the model possible. So I've chosen paints that cover well here. I'm gonna maybe pop a wash down, something like that, and that's gonna help me get 90% of my model done as fast as possible. I'm not even bored yet, I've not had time to be bored, and I'm still enthusiastic at the point that I get to the eyes and the detailing where I'm gonna slow down quite a lot, and I'm really gonna try and enjoy uh, you know, putting these really important details on my model and doing his base. 
So I'm following a piece of art reference here. It doesn't have to be exactly the colors that you want to use, but it is really helpful to have something to refer to. Put it behind you where you're painting. So mine will be behind my miniature on my desk, not out of the way, not, you know, like I've not got something else playing on my phone. I have to change that to go back and check it. It should be there permanently to help you work from it as you're going through. If you're watching a tutorial, the same goes for that. Put it right behind the miniature, make it as convenient as possible. Something that people underuse these days is, you know, actual physical stuff rather than digital. If there's a couple of key points in that tutorial, take a screenshot, print it off and have them behind you. I really, really thoroughly recommend it. Same goes for nature reference photos, whether that's on a tablet or physically printed off as well. Or a book. Books still exist, right? So this one isn't 100% necessary, but it's something that I quite like and I find really adds to my enjoyment of miniature painting. While I'm often trying to do things as fast as possible, with a lot of paint jobs, I will pick one key aspect of the model and I will try and push myself or try something new in that regard. So that might be uh, just spending longer on the eyes because I want to practice them and I know that'll make a difference to the miniature. Painting flesh, you know, I'm not very good at painting flesh, so I might pick a model that's only got the face exposed and tell myself I'll spend a long time on the face. Again, that's an important part of the model. Do some, you know, do some freehand on a shield or do some chipping on a shield. I would really recommend giving it a go. Even if you're in a rush, pick something that's small and shouldn't take too long. Watch a tutorial or get some advice from a friend or something like that and be prepared to put more time into that aspect of the model. You should really find it raising your enjoyment. You know, it's nice to have something you can be proud of and trying and learning new things is one of the best things about this hobby. It might not always go according to plan, that's also fine. You'll learn and you cannot apply the mistakes that you made last time, the next time that you try it. So we've used our good quality, solid coverage paints. We've made a really good deal of progress. I've used dry brushing, you can see plenty more information about that on the channel, linking videos here, 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 everywhere, hopefully. Now we're gonna concentrate on the bit for me that is gonna make this model stand out. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on his face. I'll do some highlights there. You don't need to highlight all of your model, just highlight a couple of bits or, you know, spend a little bit more time dry brushing them up or buffing them up or even weathering them or chipping them or something like that. Put them in the key areas. Another massive tip is to blend your miniature with its base. Put it in its environment. Don't just stand it like, if a space marine has landed on this hugely dusty Mars red planet, he's not gonna have shiny shoes, okay? I cannot emphasize enough just how important this is in instantly raising the quality of any miniature. Blend your miniature with its base or think of some way to make it suitable for its environment. If it's on a really snowy base, put some snow on its shoes. You know, there's so many things that this could apply to. If he's got a really scratched gun, he should probably have really scratched armor. Think about the coherency of your piece just on the miniature itself, but in terms of tying the miniature with its base. So, on the key part of our model where we're spending the time, which is the glowing effects, the lighting effects. If you're following someone's tutorial, do your best to follow it completely the first time you do it. You can adapt after that time, but if you don't wanna have some unforeseen consequences, then pick a model that's at an appropriate level. Don't pick, you know, like some godly 10 hour technique and try and do it in 30 minutes. It's just not gonna happen. Pick an appropriately timed quality of technique and put all of that time into it and follow it as close to the letter as you possibly can. Like I said, printouts or references or whatever. Take this one aspect of your miniature really seriously. Spend more time on the bits that are gonna jump out to anyone looking at your miniature, including you. If you're doing the weapon bright green like we are here, then maybe it's worth putting some crisp edge highlights on it just in that area. Spend a little bit of extra time on this small amount of areas that are the most important. Amazing tip, you'll really, really reap the benefits if you can be disciplined with that and don't feel like you're letting your paint job down if you don't highlight, you know, the bottom of his shoes or the back of his calves or whatever. Generally speaking, you're gonna look at your image from one direction, other people are gonna look at it from one direction, pick two or three key aspects and go to town on just those bits. All right, we're basically there actually. Um, so let's cover a couple of quick things on basing. Put a little bit of thought into your base, maybe look at some art references or some nature references and do something that you think is cool. Be willing to build up the height of your base. Um, you know, you can just squidge some green stuff down there or some putty or, you know, print off something if you've got a 3D printer, uh, use a resin bit or put a dead part of an enemy. Whatever it is, pick a little key aspect, pop it on there 
and go to town with tufts, with flock, dry leaves, anything like that that will add a little bit of detail and interest to the miniature. But you should not find yourself rushing towards the end. You can rush at the start, you're gonna cover up most of those steps. Anyway, you need a good quality base coat, and then after the base coat, anything that you do, you're probably gonna cover over with either a contrast or more layers or something like that. So you wanna put down good quality fundamentals, but there is no reason to start rushing towards the end of a piece. Like try and keep a consistent quality throughout and still put the same amount of love in in the last 10% that you did in the first 10% and in the middle 10%. 80%, you know what I mean? The middle, the 10% in the middle. Maths, not my strong point. All right, we've got our principles, let's put them to practice. So this is me putting all of these into practice on the model that you've already seen in bits and bobs. We've kept it fairly expansive, so if there's any part of that that you didn't see answered, you should be able to see me putting it into practice. You know, not quite in real time, but fairly thoroughly on the modeling question. This model took us three to four hours. I know the Games Workshop version of this model took five days, but you know, it was paid at every metal standard. So one thing I want you to bear in mind is that whether you're spending three to four hours, 30 minutes, 30 hours, all of this video's content, the reason that we've concentrated on focus so much is it's about focusing your concentration and your time and your enjoyment into the bits that are gonna help you get the most out of the model and improve as a painter. So we're gonna be spending 80% of our time, it is the 80-20 rule, I'm sure you've all already cottoned on to that, 80% of our time is being spent on the 20% that matters the most and the remaining 80% we got done already in 20% of the time super fast, so we're not even bored before we get to the bit where our concentration is needed. I personally am probably the most happy with this model and the experience painting it out of any model I did in 2022, so much so that I didn't put him on a base and he's gonna go in the cabinets behind me, because I was that pleased with him. Anyway, we'll catch you for some more information in the outro. Let's jump into me painting the Necron Lord. As normal, you got timestamps. Skip around to your pleasure. Okay, so we have our carefully chosen miniature. I have taken my time with the preparation of this. I think I spent about 30 minutes on it. Obviously that might seem like quite a lot, but we're gonna be using texture-based techniques. So I think it's extremely important to uh, not leave any little lumpy bumpy bits out there because they'll be shown up. One of the main things that I use for ensuring that, especially on rounded models, is sanding sponge, which I cut from the back and hold like this. And then what you can do, if this is the round part of my model, you can run it backwards and forwards like this and it will smooth out the area that you want to smooth out perfectly. Really, really good tip. The Citadel scrape is great too. Let's rock on to the first step, which is putting down our base coat. So I've already base coated this miniature and how I chose to do that was with Word Bearers Red, which covers quite well. I can test that out by testing it on my texture palette. If it covers that easily, it'll cover my model easily because that was Chaos Black and this is Chaos Black. And to that, I've just added a little bit of black to make it slightly darker because that's what I want to go for for the first stage of my model. One of the things that the brown base coat achieves is that the recesses are gonna look brown, obviously, rather than black. I don't want them to be fully black and dark, but if I miss a bit and it is recessed, I would like it to fit in with the paint job that I've got for my model. So I'm gonna be using Series D for this, and we're gonna be using dry brushing as much as possible to make the most of the wonderful texture and volumes on this miniature. I'm gonna use the largest brush possible for the job, um, as long as it can fit in the areas that I need to. So that's probably going to be the large or the medium. So I'm just going to put one drop of water off the back of the brush that I'm going to use in my dampening pad, work it in, and that's going to be how we introduce moisture to our dry brushing. This is very important because it'll keep it looking nice and high quality. And how we're going to choose the colour is we're going to take the base coat, and we're going to mix it with the colour that we want, and we'll get a nice natural transition. I'm going to use a different older brush um, when I'm not using dropper bottles. What using an older brush uh, allows me to do is not worry about damaging a new brush when I scoop up great big loads of paint. You don't want paint to reach the ferrules of your brushes. That's kind of bad for their life expectancy. To this mix, I'm gonna add a tiny bit of any black. I'm just using Vallejo's. Citadels would be fine too. And as you can see, I've put them in lines on my palette. I'm gonna mix a color that I'm happy with. So I want a nice dark base coat that I can work up from. And the aim here is to cover pretty much all of the model. So this is like the overbrushing or the first step that you've seen in the slap shot method where you cover everything in the gray, but we're doing this guy in silver, so we're gonna hit it with a pretty solid coat. Now, as we've covered, it's really important to pick colors that are gonna cover well. 
And what we're going to do is we're just going to let the model do the work for us, gently dry brushing these areas. We're not obsessed with having a lot of paint on the brush because we've picked a paint that covers really easily. So what we can do is just take our time and concentrate on getting a really nice flat base coat. This one should pretty much achieve it in one. You shouldn't be afraid about mixing colors, by the way, especially if we're going to be washing over it. If you don't have a perfect mix and it's not exactly like the last time you did it, generally speaking, I would say it doesn't really matter too much. People obsess about that far too readily, I think. So getting quite a high quality base coat here, it's going down in one. We're putting it absolutely everywhere. And if you remember, a key stone of the technique is to use the efficient methods uh, and maybe a few steps more than you would think uh, is fast but uh, in a way that you can do them really, really quick. So we might even do five steps on this armor, but because all of them are quick, and we don't have to worry about staying in the lines or anything, they're gonna go way, way, way quicker than doing like one or two steps where you've got to really worry about, you know, whether you slip outside of the area that you're trying to paint or you hit its cloak by accident or something like that. Even the areas that are gonna be gold are getting painted silver and we'll be fixing that with a really clever step in the near future, so don't worry if it doesn't make sense now, all will be revealed very soon. Okay, so you could use a contrast for this. I'm actually gonna make my own kind of contrast equivalent though. Take a null oil, I'm gonna use one drop of that. On my palette is fine, we're gonna be working quickly, it won't dry out. I'm gonna add a little bit of our black to it to make it that bit darker and then I'm going to do something that people find scary that they shouldn't, which is to drop another slightly strange colour in. That's going to be Magos Purple. Test it on his foot. If I'm okay with the mix, then it'll go all over the model. I'm okay with the mix. So this is going all over the miniature, and a really important part of applying washes at high quality or contrast at high quality is to not rush it too much and to not oversaturate. So I'm going to keep him held at roughly the same orientation, put it all over the miniature, and what I'll do is I'll take a scoop, I'll put it down, and then I'll use that scoop or the place that that scoop is as a well, and I'll go using that instead of going back to the palette for more and more and more for as long as possible before going back again. This is going absolutely everywhere on the model. We don't need to worry about slipping up or getting it in the wrong areas, and do make sure that you get it in the recesses as well. As you can see, we are fully dry. That's really important. If you use a hairdryer, let your model cool down a little bit afterwards, otherwise it will affect how the paint behaves. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna take whatever color was in our base coat. So for us, that's our silver here. Now we've darkened it down, whatever we used our previous layer. So I'm gonna have it slightly lighter than it was. Work a load of it off my brush. And this is our testing place. So we're gonna make all of our mistakes here instead of on our model. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna gently dry brush and buff up our mini. Now, if when you go to it, it looks too bright, just go and add a little bit of your previous color or whatever you're using to darken it, in this case, the black. Get that mix right, test it again. You'll have where it was previously on your palette. Look at it next to it. That's darker than I was, so I should be okay with that. Work off the excess and then gently repeat again. There we go. So we've done our testing and our screwing up mostly there. Not all there, but mostly. So now what I'm gonna do is go all over my model. I'm using circular motions. And this is gonna kind of hit our edges more than other areas. And what we've done here is that the areas in the recesses have been hit by the wash and we're already a good color book, so our base coat. And the raised areas are getting a load of attention just because of the nature of the technique of dry brushing that we're using. So we're gonna do this absolutely everywhere on the model apart from the blade that I've missed and that's going to bring everything up a little bit brighter. So that's been done all over. We've got a really good quality uh, kind of very very realistic looking metallic going on there. Final step is to take, we're going to be careful with this, we're using our silver pure. Now again we can refer to how things are going to go on the palette so that's a lot brighter than that. This should be a big jump up and you must remove a lot of the paint from your brush. Doesn't matter whether this is metallic or not metallic, whatever you're doing, you want this step to be very, very light and very, very careful. So I'm introducing a little bit of moisture here. That's gonna do a couple of things. It's gonna dilute the paint, which is gonna soften it a little bit, and it's gonna reduce the chance of it looking grainy. It's important for us that this goes well. So start on an area you wanna be bright. For me, that's around the face. 
And then again with the same circular method, we're going to go all over the miniature. Now, what this will do is the bits that stick out the most, they'll get hit, they'll become the most shiny, and the bits that are in the recesses are not going to get touched. There's barely any paint on the brush, and because we've done all of our techie removal of paint here and testing here, actually, once you've started, you don't have to worry about being too careful on the miniature. You test once, if it's going okay, you're fine, and you can rock on. This little detail there on his wrist is a perfect example. We've got like three or four different layers of texture. It gets more shiny as it gets further out. It's looking really, really excellent. So a little bonus of doing the last step with a bit more moisture added is we've basically already kind of finished cleaning our brush nearly. I'm just gonna basically do what I was doing before on my texture palette instead of the model. Keep rotating the brush and it's almost entirely clean. We can do that with soap after we've painted in about a minute and it'll be entirely clean. You might have noticed I've got my art reference in the background on my little stand. I want to get this kind of chestnutty brown on the go uh, with the metallics. Um, rather than painting them entirely from base coat to something else, I'm just going to drop maybe one or two repeats, but I'm just going to drop one wash over the top of it, and I'm pretty much planning on hacking my way through that without having to put too much effort into it. Rather than telling you just one colour, I'm going to show you how I pick the colour. Now, these are three contrasts. Turn them upside down, I'm going to get a rough indication of how they look like, kind of exaggerated. I'm going to pick the most chestnutty of these, and we'll test it on the palette. So that's the Gorgonta fur. Wake it up, take our not Sunday best brush, and I'm going to pop it down. Okay, that is incredibly strong. We need to dilute that. I do like the colour though. Take something softer, Reclam Flash Shade. All right, now we're talking. So what we're going to do is, using the mix and the properties of these two, we're going to test somewhere a little bit out the way. So just some random spot on the cloak will do nicely. Hmm. It's not yellow enough, so I'll add a yellow wash. Not using a yellow contrast because I want something that's kind of transparent. There we go. Now we're cooking. That looks more goldy to me. So that's the mix that we're going to go for, which is Cassandora Yellow, mixed with a contrast of Gorgonza fur. Don't get fixated on the particular colours I'm using here. It's the, uh, it's the way that we're arriving at our conclusions that is important. We're testing on the palette, and then any mistakes are made there. Now we're just going to pick the areas that we want gold. We're going to do that, and this is going to be a wash that's applied in exactly the same way as the last one. Obviously now we've got to be a little bit more careful than we did previously because we're trying to not hit the wrong area, so slow down a little bit at this point. You can always wash twice, remember that. And if you're trying to make something look metallic, I think washing an area twice is a really good bet because it tends to add a little bit of extra depth that you can't get another way. So we've not used a single gold paint and things are already going fine turning on miniature gold. It's just very, very efficient to paint in this kind of contrasty style. So it's time for our second wash. Just as before, we've got an area of the palette we hit with the first wash. I'm going to put some Reclan Flesh Shade on my palette or brush. So I'm looking to deepen it. I've had a look at it and I want it a bit deeper, a bit warmer, a bit more chestnutty as we were aiming for. Okay, so this should work out all right. Take it to the model, give it a test. Yeah, we're good. So that's going to deepen the gold quite a bit and pull it away from that yellowy feeling we've got going on. Again, this is a shade, so it's not going to delete the work that we put into the metallics underneath at all, and nor is it going to delete the yellow. It's going to do this all over. As it's a shade, you don't have to worry too much about being really delicate with it, but again, just try and avoid excess pulling, and you should be absolutely fine. little tip here. So if you want to add more depth like this shoulder pad, you can use a thicker or heavier coat. If you don't, remove some of your off your brush and then we're just going to use this wash as a glaze. So we're not looking to pull anywhere, we're just looking to pop a filter down over the area that we're in. So in this instance I want it a bit thicker than that, but uh, that's just an example of how you could use it. So I'm going to use a little bit more and I'm going to blob it on in a way where 
it pulls in the center and that'll add a load of depth to these sections. So same goes for the silver sections. We've got that Magos Purple and Null Oil mix and we're dotting it. So place it, don't let it run beyond the zone that you're picking and dot it in the middle and it will do a load of the shading for you without you having to do edge highlighting or anything fancy like that whatsoever. Absolute magic. It's important not to go into the recesses here uh, in the same go that you go around the raised areas. So I would do one then the other if you do feel the need to go into the recesses. You've got to keep it thinnish, otherwise it will pull downwards and the effect won't work as well. Shade tip number two, let's look at the difference in what happens if we go to the full area, to the edges of our area, or if we dot in the middle. So hopefully this works right on camera, it's quite hard to demonstrate. If you leave a dot, a dot's got edges, it doesn't pull up against anything that's close to. If you run it up to the edges, immediately, rather than pulling in the middle, it will pull at the edges of the walls. So this isn't necessarily good or bad, but if you're aware of this, you can pick where to place and how to work your shades, or you can get two completely different effects, e.g. the darker at the edges versus darker at the middle on the same model. So here we were dotting, and we weren't going to the edges, therefore we were shading uh, with it darker in the middle. Here, if we're going over the entire area, we're making it darker at the edges. That's two completely different effects from the same thing, and it's literally just down to a little change in pressure. So if I want to make this rivet, or whatever it is on his knee, Stand out. I don't go to the edge. There we go. Whoops. This is exactly what you can use to get edge highlights out of things as well, or uh, recess shades. So yeah, be aware of how they work and they will work so much better for you. Okay, so part of the reason for doing the yellow first is if we made any mistakes, which we did, of course, we can fix them very easily. So we're not going to fix it 100% because this is a, it's a semi-transparent wash, but we can pretty much hide it altogether. So in doing the silver after the gold rather than before, we're doing things in order whereby we don't even have to fix our mistakes. We just do the next step and it will fix any that we were unlucky enough to make. <laughs> Pop those bubbles. You can always do it twice over a particular area if it's a bit more stubborn. This wash is actually going all over, so anywhere where we want to deepen the gold, we have the option of putting this over. I put it over fairly thin, so we're using it like a glaze, we're not massively aiming for pooling or anything like that. And with that as the final step on the gold, we've actually done a really, really good job of deepening things right down. Super convenient. The end result is absolutely brilliant as well. Continuing the theme, uh, we're going to use Black Legion to kind of darken down the stuff as weapon. But it's a bit severe on its own, so we're going to mix it with Null Oil, as we have been with basically everything else. We don't know how strong it is. Again, we'll test here. It's there for that. That's why we're using it. So over silver section, still too strong. More Null Oil. There we go. Remember, you can always do it twice if you need. And again, um, what I'm probably going to do here is I'll dot it in the centers of each of these once. That'll give us that kind of deep effect and it'll separate them in rings. And I'll do one all over, which will make sure that we don't miss the recesses as well. When you're doing a circular area, because washes actually dry fairly fast, especially over themselves, and this has already been washed, make sure you work your way around it pretty quick. You can do them ring by ring if you're worried about this. But uh, yeah, when you join things together and one's dry and you're joining it with wet, that's when you get nasty tile marks, which are to be avoided at all costs. Let's be honest, 
Sometimes things don't go according to plan. That's fine. Uh, we're going to change tack. I'm going to take Moot Green. And basically, we're going to take the same approach that we have everywhere else in the model, which is paint it a bit brighter than we want, and then wash it a bit. So I'm fine with this being the base coat for now, underneath just any the, the same mix that we use. That's OK. I'm going to block in all these areas carefully and neatly. I'll swap to a better brush than this that is less old. And uh, yeah, we're going to end up with a very, very bright blade that we can bring down in color. Just an efficient way to do it, which mimics the rest of the model. Okay, so let's let's pretend that we've not just stripped that weapon and uh, started again. <laughs> right, so base coating in moot green, ideally that will work better for you if you put a light colour underneath it because it's not got crazy good coverage. So we're starting to do some slightly fancy stuff now, and by that I mean we've got Baby D. I'm going to be doing a bit of very, very delicate dry brushing around any areas that, that we want glowing. Do it from the direction of your source. Could be eyes, could be on his head, whatever. Take it from the source and push it away. That's it, it's pretty easy really. Anywhere where there's a green thing close to it, start where the green is and push outwards. Okay, so we've got a couple of greens on the palette. I don't know if we'll need both of them. What I'm going to do though, it should be fairly forgiving and it's just quickly stipple a little bit of a transition on to mimic the artwork. I am slowing down now, so you know, I'm willing to put a little bit of time and effort into this. Then what we'll do is if we need to, we can mix them up into a wash. Not sure if we're even going to need the spring green. is surprisingly weak. Always best to cover more than you think with first steps. You gotta leave yourself the room for the second steps. So really this is just going on the weapon. I'm not paying attention to the other bits. The weapon's gonna get the focus. Maybe I'll do a tiny bit down here with Baby D soon.
starting to look a little fancier now. I've been using pushing um, pushing the washes against the edge highlights where I've screwed the edge highlights up to make the highlights look neater than they are. Really, really useful tip. Quickly show you that. So I've still got some of the thematic blue on the palette. That softens things and makes it a little bit um, a little bit less worrying working with dark colors next to light colors. And then basically, just as we did with our washer initially, where we were dotting it rather than, you know, kind of washing it over the entire thing, your aim is to push towards the area where you want the darkest and just leave a little blob there. So with this, I can actually skinny out that edge highlight a little there. And sometimes that's easier than doing the edge highlight again or doing it more narrow or whatever. So uh, yeah, there's multiple ways to go at it. Just so you guys are aware, if I am doing edge highlighting, I don't do it here hovering in front of the camera. I get my wrists right down on the table or my elbows so I can brace it in front of my face. But either way, I bring them in as close to my face as possible. It sounds basic, but that helps so much. It's pretty much the most helpful thing you can do. Don't rush, take your time. And the other one is use your brush point down. Don't try and wipe it because you'll get a wobbly line like that rather than a little contact point. All right, we're done. So thank you very much for choosing to watch this tutorial. If it's one of your first miniature painting tutorials, Thank you very much for choosing this one. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate under the apprehension that you know they're beginnery or you know it's a silly question or anything like that. Every single question is valid, and quite a lot of people have commented in the past that other people asking questions has answered their questions. So don't hesitate, pop it below. We will read and reply to each and every one of them. If it's your thousandth tutorial or miniature that you've painted, I hope that you have found this useful. Um, let us know if you think you could apply the 80-20 rule or the principles that we've used to your miniatures. I had so much fun painting this miniature and you know the actual process of painting it. I'm not only pleased with the end result but I really enjoyed painting the miniature. Even when I screwed up the weapon, had to strip just the weapon itself and start again in less than ideal circumstances. I didn't mind because I got there quite fast and I just enjoyed everything that led up to that. I'd done 80% of the model, 20% of the time because of sticking to the principles and it really helped me enjoy the miniature. On the subject of that, one of our upcoming tutorials is going to be a demon prince. He'll be appearing on the screen now. He turned out really well. He's got some metallics on him. And another video that we're going to be doing is this style of video, a big one, like 45 minutes an hour, whatever it is, on getting the most out of metallics, understanding metallics, etc. So we're going to do a giveaway for the best suggestion for a question that you would like answered about metallics. We're going to get you guys to supply the winner for this. So whichever comment is the most liked, which is a suggestion for something that needs answering about metallics or content for the metallics understanding video, um, go down there and vote and uh, we'll send you a set of your choosing, SMOD, and a texture palette. That's it. Again, the reason that we're doing these videos is because we're trying to give you exactly the same experience I would give in an in-person demo or tutorial. Um, I hope that that's successful. It's quite hard over the internet, but we're trying to give you all the means to answer your own questions and your own issues in the future and help you make better decisions and enjoy the hobby more because there's far too many minis out there and there's definitely not enough time for all the minis that I have in a cupboard that's behind me. So. That's it. Please like, please comment, please subscribe, and we'll catch you in the next video. Um, it's going to be metallic-y, and it's going to be chaos -y. We'll put a spoiler here. We'll see you soon. Done.